All right. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yes. Perfect. Awesome. All right. So it is time. So I'll start. So um, hello, everyone. Uh, nice to nice to see you in this at this great conference. So I'm going to talk today about uh, distributed systems and in particular distributed database rather and how they uh, how they work under the hood. Um, how they um, how they are implemented actually, and just dive a little bit into the kind of the internals of uh, uh, systems like Apache Net, for example. This is what I'm working with, and pretty much any other distributed database out there. Uh, I'm sorry, just one sec. Yeah, my name is Valentin Kulchenko. I'm uh, one of the committers and uh, PMC members of the Apache Ignite project. Uh, Apache Ignite is a distributed uh, in-memory or memory-centric rather database, uh, which provides multiple different APIs on top of the data that you can store distributedly in, um, in, in big clusters. And I also work as a product manager at uh, Grid Gain Systems, where we basically built a memory computing platform which is based on the Apache Ignite project. Apache Ignite is essentially the biggest, uh, the biggest component for us. So um, what I want to talk again is essentially about um, how distributed databases work, what are the main components of those distributed systems, and basically kind of how they interact with each other in order to create this single entity uh, that users can uh, use to store their data and to process their data. And what I actually am going to do is I'm going to essentially create an architecture of a typical distributed database from scratch. And I will go step by step based on the certain requirements that I have. And I currently have requirements on the, on, on the screen. So um, requirements are very simple. And of course, of course, I simplify a lot of things. I'm not going in very deep into details. Uh, into the weeds of uh, you know mature distributed systems, I cover very simple requirements. But covering these requirements, we will actually get a fully functional distributed database, although with very limited functionality. So here are the requirements. So first of all, we're going to have an in-memory data storage. Uh, Apache Ignite is an in-memory database, uh, or at least it can be just pure in-memory database. It also provides persistence. But again, I'm doing certain things just to simplify. I don't want to go into all the complications of uh, uh, persistent storage. And I, I'm just going to focus on the in-memory data storage. The second requirement is the API. Any database, of course, has to have certain APIs so that uh, users of the database can, can interact with it. Uh, and I'm going to have a very simple key value API with just two methods. It will allow you to put the data, to put a key value pair into the database, and to read it back, providing the key and getting the value back. And it will also work with only string-based data. So keys and values are strings. Again, just for simplification, not to go into all those um, complicated details of uh, data serialization and deserialization. The third requirement is scalability. This is, of course, kind of a broad term. But what essentially I mean here is that I want to be able to uh, run my database on multiple computers, on multiple servers, so that they act as a single system, as a single entity. And uh, essentially, I want to uh, do as much as possible to abstract the user from the fact that there are multiple computers or multiple ser servers behind the scene, so that the user essentially just uses this um, uh, two public methods and is completely abstracted from the fact that there are multiple nodes. Uh, but again, scalability is a broad term, and actually it has two major uh, kind of aspects into it. The first one is what I call computational, sc computational scalability. Um, what I mean by that is that I want to be able to uh, process uh, more requests by adding more nodes. So let's say I have a single server that can handle 50K transactions per second, 50K requests per second uh, on my database. Now, if I add a second node, a second server, now I can handle 100K. If I add a third server, I can handle 150K and so on. So I want this kind of 
linear scalability of the maximum throughput of the system, essentially. And uh, the second aspect uh, of the uh, scalability is data scalability, which means that I just want to be able to store more data by adding more nodes. So let's say we, we store data in memory, right? So if I have a single server with, let's say, 100 gigabytes of RAM, uh, but I have 300 gigabytes of data, then I just start three nodes, three servers, and I'm able to store all that data uh, partitioned in that cluster of three, three servers. And of course, all those things, they essentially have to happen automatically. Again, I want to make sure that, user, that the user doesn't have to worry about this stuff. Uh, they should just use the public API methods, the put method and the get method, and the system should automatically, first of all, route requests, right? So that we distribute, it, distribute those requests across multiple nodes, and it should do this automatically and consistently, and it also should be responsible for data distribution as well, and this, of course, also has to happen automatically. Uh, user doesn't have to worry about this. All right, so let's start. Let's start with the first uh, two requirements, which are the data storage, the memory data storage, and our simple API. And as I said, I'm going to kind of draw the diagram, the architectural kind of a diagram, step by step. And the first step is to create our server-side process. So this blue, big blue box is essentially the server-side process that will run on every server that I'm going to have in the cluster. <clears throat> and the first component in the in the server side process is of course the storage. Uh, this is the company that actually stores the data. In terms of the implementation, if we're using Java uh, with uh, with our requirements, it actually can be just a very simple concurrent hash map. Of course, if we add more requirements, it, it will get more complicated. But with these requirements, that would be enough. Uh, the second component that we need is some sort of communication layer. We want to be able to connect to the database remotely from remote clients. And therefore, uh, we need this communication uh, component that will essentially be responsible for all the networking, uh, creating sockets, maintaining connections, and everything else, and implementing certain communication uh, protocol uh, in the sense that it will have certain set of messages and it will be able to serialize, just serialize them, and, uh, and so on. So that's the server side. Now let's add the client. The green box is the client. And the client uh, will, of course, has the same communication layer because it needs to be able to communicate with the server. So it needs to implement the same communication protocol and all those same, all the same serialization mechanisms for communication messages. And it will also have the uh, public API layer, which is uh, essentially just the company that exposes the public APIs, uh, the public API methods. So what will happen is uh, the application that a user of our database creates will embed the instance of the client into the application and will invoke the public API methods. And uh, let's say the application invokes put method, uh, the API layer uh, gets the request, translates it to a certain communication message, which is sent to the server side and process there and then response is sent back. So it's so far, it's actually very straightforward, very simple. Uh, client server architecture, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. So let's actually get to the fun part and look at scalability. So as I said, scalability is essentially just a fact at this point, at least it's just a fact that we want to have multiple servers uh, forming a single cluster. So let's add a second node. Let's add a second uh, server side process. This process is exactly the same. It's exactly equal to the first one. It has the same storage component, the same communication component, and essentially the client can connect to both of them independently. But the thing is, at this point, they don't really know about each other, right? So there is no cluster. We just have two independent processes not aware of each other. So we need to fix that. Uh, and we fix that by adding a special component which will be responsible for that, and we call this company Discovery. Discovery essentially answers uh, several questions. It answers um, uh, what are the nodes currently in the cluster, how many of them we have, and you know where those nodes are located, what are the IP addresses of those nodes and port numbers, and uh, what is the health of those nodes, right? Whether they're up and running or maybe something wrong is with them, there is something wrong with them or something like that. So all that is uh, what Discovery is responsible for. And of course, Discovery 
uh, one of the goals of the discovery protocol is to make sure that this information is maintained consistently across all the nodes. So essentially, it's kind of a meta storage for this kind of meta information about the cluster. There are multiple ways of implementing this. Uh, any mature system will actually have it essentially kind of embedded in the system itself. Uh, Ignite, for example, uses kind of a ring-based protocol. Uh, other systems uh, use some sort of consensus, consensus protocols for this. But another way of doing this, and actually the simplest way, is to have an external storage uh, to store this meta information. Uh, in my reference I'm implementation, I'm using ETCD database, which is a, just a very simple key value database, very good for this kind of purposes. It also can be Apache Zootiper, for example, also a very good candidate. I've used ETCD just because it has slightly simpler APIs. That's the only reason. Apache Zootiper might work here as well perfectly. Uh, so essentially what will happen uh, when the node uh, starts, when, a, when one of these processes starts and wants to join the cluster, so the, the cluster? There will be three steps that this node has to go through. The first step is it will go to the ETCD database uh, and in our meta storage and read the information about current currently running nodes. So there will be essentially kind of a list of the nodes that are currently running. So it will read the list and uh, then it will also start listening for updates so that it's notified whenever you know something changes in our topology. And then it will also write the information about itself into the into the list. Right. So the first node joins, it uh, uh, tries to read the list, the list is empty. Uh, so it, it, it just starts listening for those updates, for notifications, and writes its own information into the, into the list. So the list now has a single element. Then the second node joins uh, the same cycle. It reads the list, which now has a single node, uh, a single item, and then also starts listening for updates and writes its own information. And once it does that, this last step, the first node gets the notification. And essentially what happens is that current, uh, at this point, uh, both uh, instances of the discovery company on two different nodes will have the exact same information and that's exactly what we're looking for. So this way we achieve this kind of awareness within the cluster. But what about the client, right? We, we also have the client, which is currently, currently doesn't have any of that information. <clears throat> Again, multiple ways of doing this. One of the options is do exactly the same add the discovery component into the client and make it connect to the same ETCD database and go through the exact same cycle, except for the last step, of course, because we don't need the client to register itself. So it will uh, read the current uh, the information about the current topology and also will listen for updates. And this way, the client will also, uh, at any point in time, will know what are the, uh, what are the current nodes uh, in topology and um, uh, where those nodes are located. So uh, at this point, we kind of achieved scalability. So we can have a cluster of multiple nodes, but we don't really use it as a, at this point, obviously, because we uh, still need to implement all the mechanisms for request routing from, from the client to server and also mechanism for uh, data distributions. Uh, data distribution. So look, let's, uh, let's look at that. And let's look at the request routing first. So if you look at the diagram, right, we have the uh, discovery component, which um, has all this information, but at the same time, we don't really use this information. Uh, what this means uh, is that we can utilize that, right? Uh, so let's do exactly that, and we'll do that on, on the client side. What, what we want to achieve now is uh, to make sure that the system can decide uh, which node to send a certain request to. So we get a key value pair and uh, based on the key that we are getting, we want to decide uh, which node to send the request to and essentially choose the node. So what we'll do is we add one more component here, which is called mapper. And the mapper will do exactly that. It will be responsible for this mapping between the key uh, the API is invoked for and the node where this key is stored or supposed to be stored. Uh, so the, what Weber will do is it will first go into the discovery component and ask for the current topology. And remember, discovery always knows uh, about the uh, nodes which are currently in the cluster. So it will give essentially the list of uh, currently running nodes. Uh, the mapper will 
uh, take the key that comes from the API, get the uh, take the information from Discovery, do some magic there, which I will talk about in a second, and uh, return back the information about the node where this key is stored, like the, the address or maybe the ID of this node or some other information which we might need. And the API then will send, will use the communication component to send this request to a particular node instead of like broadcasting or doing this randomly or something like that. It will send to a particular node which is chosen by the mapper. So what is that magic, quote unquote, that mapper does? Of course, you know, if you work with okay, like hash maps or similar data structures, you probably already thought about hashing and that's exactly what we're going to do here. We will use hashing mechanisms to uh, do this kind of mapping. So exactly the, like the very simple implementation, which we'll start with and it's gonna change, but that's what we're starting with. <clears throat> we simply just calculate the hash code for the key. Uh, I also apply the ABI's, ABA's function here to get rid of the negative numbers. And then we apply modular function based on the number of nodes that we have. And that gives us the index of the uh, node in the list uh, which we got from discovery. And that's how we get the information we need. So again, this is a very basic uh, implementation uh, which uh, is going to get a little bit more complicated but that is enough for current requirements that we have. So at this point, we actually covered uh, first four requirements already and we have the requirement number five, which is data distribution, automatic data distribution. And if you think about this, uh, we actually already have uh, achieved data distribution to a certain extent uh, because requests are routed automatically. So if you fire multiple put operations into the API, uh, put requests will go to different nodes and data will be stored on different nodes as well, which is automatic data distribution, right? But here's an issue. The, uh, this works only as long as topology doesn't change, right? So if we have like three nodes, for example, we fire those put operations, data is distributed, but once we add, let's say a fourth node, it breaks down because next get request might go to this fourth node and it will get nothing from there because there is no data, it's empty, right? So uh, it, this, Fifth requirement, it's not, it's more about data redistribution. So essentially we want to make sure that whenever topology changes, we consistently maintain the data distribution based on the uh, mapping that we wanna have. So let's uh, go back to our diagram and fix that issue and make sure that uh, we implement this, uh, what we call data rebalancing process. This is essentially what I've just described. Uh, it is called data rebalancing. So what we'll do to, to achieve that, we'll add the same uh, oh, first, yeah, as a first step. Uh, remember discovery uh, gets notifications from ETCD in our case, or it might be something else, um, about uh, changes in the list uh, which describes topology, right? So if, if let's say node is added into topology, discovery will actually get a notification. So what discovery can do is notify the storage about this and essentially tell storage like, hey, we have a new node here. So you should probably check all your data that you have and uh, verify if certain keys um, has to be moved to other nodes, right? So we want this uh, distribution be consistent with the requests that are routed within the system. So obviously, naturally we want to use the same mapper component here on the server side and will actually do the exact same thing. So what, what essentially will happen is that the storage will now go through all the key value pairs, through all the keys that are stored. And for every key, we'll cons consult the mapper and check if uh, uh, this key should be stored locally, locally or not. And if not, it will also get the information about the node where it should be stored and it will, will be able to set it, send it out to that correct node and do the rebalancing process through the communication layer. So this red arrow just shows the whole process of data reshuffling that happens under the hood. So essentially what we did here is we achieved consistency between request routing and data distribution. So whenever topology changes, um, the data will be redistributed and any requests that are routed based on new topology, we also will also uh, work with the data that is distributed based on the same algorithm, right? So we'll, we'll not get this inconsistency that I've described 
uh, before. Yeah, uh, before going, so uh, there is a certain inefficiency here. So it kind of works functionally, but there is a significant inefficiency. So I've mentioned that the storage essentially has to go through all the keys um, that it has stored, which is a problem, of course. Uh, we don't know how many keys we're going to have. We, we, we might have zero keys. We might have millions of keys. And we don't want to have this linear complexity because it is very possible that this verification step, just this verification step will take a lot of time if we have a lot of keys. So we want to optimize this process. And the way we do this is we introduce what we call data partitioning. And this is the, uh, this is the technique that, use, that is used pretty much in any distributed database that I've seen, at least, <laughs> um, because it's very efficient in this kind of scenarios. And this rebalancing um, problem that I've just described is only one of the examples where it's uh, very helpful and useful. So let me explain. So the idea here is that uh, instead of working with keys, we work with, uh, with a set of buckets. And the number of buckets is configured and kind of predefined before the database is created, right? So let's say uh, we have, we're, we're configuring our database to have 10 partitions, which will essentially mean that, uh, and this, uh, we, we will always have 10 partitions regardless of how many nodes we have, right? So we have two nodes, then the first node has five partitions, the second node has five partitions, and then we add the third node. Partitions now are redistributed across the cluster, but we still have 10 of them, which means that within the mapper where we currently, where we had like a very simple hashing function before, uh, we actually need to introduce this kind of two-step process, right? So we first, uh, we get the key, we map the key into, into the partition number first, and then we map partition to the node. And the first step looks like this. It, it is actually very similar to what we had before in our basic hashing function. We calculate the hash code for the key, but uh, and then apply module operation, but not based on the number of nodes, but based on the number of partitions. And again, partition count is a constant number, which means that this step is actually always is actually constant as well. So if a certain key is mapped to partition eight, for example, it will always be mapped to partition eight, regardless of whether we, regardless of how many nodes we have, regardless of uh, which node this partition is stored on, uh, regardless of uh, whether we have this key actually stored in the database or not, or not even. So this key is always mapped to a certain partition. And then the second step looks uh, like, like this to start with. So we. Here, just take the partition number and apply modular function based on the number of nodes. And this step is, of course, dynamic, which means that when, when topology changes, we need to reshuffle partitions rather than keys. And uh, coming back to our uh, problem with this uh, verification step, this essentially means that uh, whenever we uh, get the notification, whenever the storage gets the notification from discovery, it now has to check uh, the fixed and constant number of partitions rather than going through all the keys, which is the unpredictable amount. So that actually covers all the five requirements that I've uh, outlined um, in the beginning. Uh, there is actually, uh, however, one more requirement, which is kind of a hidden one. and. Uh, this requirement requirement is called minimal disruption. And the best way of explaining what the issue is and what we're trying to solve is basically just to go through an example. So let's, uh, let's take a look at a sample data distribution in our database. And uh, let's say, for example, we have uh, three nodes to start with, and we have 10 partitions. Again, this is just something we predefined and we configure when we create our database. So uh, uh, the way our basic function works is that the ID of the node where a certain partition will be stored is calculated as the partition index or like number of the partition in the list, modular function three, uh, where three is the current number of nodes. So let's see how it looks like. So this is, uh, this is the list of partitions that we have from zero to nine. And uh, this is the, uh, uh, these are the nodes 
where those partitions are stored. So with this function, we actually get this kind of round robin distribution, 0, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, and, and so on. So, so far, so good. Let's uh, kind of visualize it and see how it looks like. So we have three nodes, and uh, we have several partitions on every node. So we have uh, four of those partitions on node four, or node one, sorry, node zero, rather, and then uh, three partitions uh, on each of other two nodes, which is a very good distribution. It's, uh, uh, it's as even distribution as we can get uh, with 10 partitions and three nodes, uh, which is a good thing. This is something we're uh, also looking for. Now let's take a look at what happens when we add one more node into the picture. And now we have inst four nodes inst uh, instead of three nodes. The function is the same, number of partitions is the same, right? The, the only difference is that when we apply the modular function um, for the partition index, we use four instead of three because that's our current number of nodes. Again, let's take a look at the table. That's the list of our partitions. This list is the same, nothing changed there. But this, uh, this one changed, of course, because we now have different number of nodes. The mapping changes, and we have this uh, couple of uh, partitions that are mapped to the uh, node index three, which is our new node, which uh, we did not have before. Let's again visualize it, do the exact same exercise. So we have four nodes, we have uh, uh, three partitions on each of the first two nodes, two partitions on uh, each of the uh, other two nodes, which is again, fairly even distribution. Looks good so far, but let's compare those two. Uh, let's compare the old distribution that we have here, uh, the new distribution that we have here, and the old one, which is currently on the top, that's the distribution with three nodes. So we do see that we have partition number three and partition number seven uh, moved from the older nodes that we had before to this new node that we've just added. And that's a good thing. This is something we wanna have, right? Because we want to have some data stored on that node. Uh, we want some requests to go through the node and essentially to utilize the resources of that new node that we've just added because that's ex essentially the, reasons, the reason why we add the node into the, into the cluster. But if we look at this carefully, we also have a bunch of these red arrows which uh, show data movements within the existing nodes that we had before the topology change. <clears throat> and that's actually a big issue because if those two green arrows as I said, they provide value. This is, this is something we're looking for from the rebalancing process. These red arrows are completely redundant. They don't provide any value whatsoever, uh, but they consume resources. They consume network, they consume CPU, everything basically. And if you look at this, uh, we, we actually have more uh, red redundant, redundant data movements than we have green arrows, than we have valuable movements. And this is a big issue. This is a, one of the biggest challenges in uh, kind of distributed systems because this one will, uh, uh, in the best case, it will just cause a performance degradation uh, for a significant amount of time. But in the first case, in the worst case, and actually most likely, it will just saturate the network, saturate the CPU, and topology will fall apart. You will have a downtime and all those bad things that we don't want to have. So uh, we did definitely need to fix that. And let's take a look at how we can do this. Again, of course, there are multiple ways of doing this and multiple algorithms uh, that address this particular issue and this particular requirement. Uh, one of the most popular ones and uh, the one that Apache Ignite actually uses and also uh, luckily the one that is um, the, most easier to the most easy to explain and understand is called random hashing. And algorithm goes as follows. It's actually very simple. What we're going to do is uh, we're going to assign a certain unique ID to every node, right? It can be a string ID, it can be UUID, it can be really anything. The only requirement is that it's unique for every single node. So here I'm just using node-1, node-2, node-3. And we'll also introduce a function, a hashing function, which is based on a pair of the partition number, uh, partition index, and this node ID. So for every partition, we essentially can calculate uh, uh, as many values of this hash function as many nodes we have. So with three nodes, we'll actually have three uh, different values of this hash function for every partition. 
And here I basically just explain how uh, we map a, one of the partitions, a random partition, right? So we'll calculate this hash function for all the nodes that we have. So we'll have values h1, h2, and h3. And then we'll pick the maximum out of those three, which is in this particular example is h2. And this maximum value will point us to the node where this key is supposed to be stored. So h2 is the maximum value. Therefore, partition is stored on node two. And that's the algorithm, actually. That's that's all. That's the whole algorithm. That's what it does. That's how it chooses um, uh, where to store a particular key, on which node to store a particular key. Now let's take a look at what happens with this algorithm if we add one more node. So we add node four into the into the cluster, which means that we can now calculate one more value for this caching function. The first three doesn't don't change, of course, because the Partition number is the same, and node IDs of the previously existing nodes, they do not change. So H1, H2, and H3, they stay the same. We just add a new one, which is H4. And we actually have only two possibilities here. The first possibility, H4 is less than H max, um, than our current, current maximum value, uh, less than H2, which means that H max does not change. It's still H2 in this example. Therefore, partition stays on node two, right? So nothing changes. The second possibility is H4 is larger than H max, which means that we have the new value for H max, which is H4. And therefore, partition is moved to the node four. So in other words, we only can, um, we either move this partition, the, we, this partition to the new node that we've just added into the topology or we don't move the partition at all. There are only two possibilities, and there is the algorithm kind of out of the box provide this uh, guarantee that our partitions will never be moved within the nodes that we have before the topology change. And of course, uh, uh, just to side note here, um, hash collisions are possible, uh, but they are handled outside of the algorithm, typically by like regenerating re node IDs, for example, or doing some, something like that. Um, but the algorithm itself typically assumes that there are no hash collisions and therefore we only have two possibilities. There is no possibility for H4 to be equal to one of the previous values. And uh, that's how it looks like with, uh, with, with the random hashing function now. Uh, so again, I've just done the exact same uh, exercise here, but just changed the implementation of the mapper, right, into, to the random hashing algorithm. So now we have uh, partitions eight and four being moved to the new node and everything else uh, stays stays the same. Uh, one of the trade-offs is that this algorithm might provide a little bit less even just distribution. So if you if you if you look at this carefully, we have like uh, four partitions on node one um, and then only two partitions on every other node with the new topology. So this is this is basically a trade-off uh, between the minimal disruption that we want to achieve, and kind of evenness of the distribution. And uh, uh, if you ever work with distributed systems, um, this kind of trade-offs are everywhere, um, which I guess makes it fun. So, um, so with that, it actually covers all the requirements. So we created the architecture uh, for for a distributed databases database, which uh, stores data in memory, which which provides a very basic uh, but fully functional key value API put method. Uh, with a key value pair and the get method that gets value by, by the key. And we also implemented all the um, essential mechanism, mechanism, mechanisms for scalability. So we added discovery just for uh, making sure that nodes are aware of each other. And we implemented the automatic request routing so that requests can be routed to different nodes within our cluster. And of course, the data distribution uh, to make sure that data is always consistently distributed with the hashing algorithm that we that we use. And finally, we also implemented the minimal disruption um, requirement to make sure that we don't have this inefficiency uh, during rebalancing process. Uh, so yeah, as I've mentioned before, I think I have this uh, reference implementation where I essentially implemented everything that I've uh, just talked about. This is a project on GitHub. So if you're interested, if you want to dive, dive a little bit deeper, uh, feel free to check the project out, play with it, run it, modify it, uh, 
do something else with it. And uh, of course, if you want to dive even deeper into distributed into the world of distributed databases, probably the best way of doing this is to uh, contribute to one of the distributed databases, for example, Apache Ignite. We are currently actually working on the next major version, which is like a significant rework. So we have a lot of development tasks which are uh, really cool and fun. So uh, you are all join, uh, welcome to join our wonderful community. So with that, uh, thank you guys uh, so much. I think I have around five minutes left. So let me see uh, if there are any questions. Okay, so I don't see anything right now. So under the under the session tab, uh, there is the QA tab, <laughs> where I think you can you should be able to ask the questions. So if there is, uh, if you guys have any questions, um, feel free to type them in there, and I will be able to respond. Okay, so there's one question. Can you show the minimal disruption function again? It was a bit fast for me, so I missed it. Sure. So yeah, that's the algorithm. So again, the algorithm uh, is extremely straightforward. All it does is it calculates uh, the hash function, which is based on the pair of partition number and node ID for every node that we have. And then picks the maximum value out of those uh, out of those numbers. Uh, so if we have three nodes, we will get for every partition we will get three numbers, three values of this hash function, and uh, whatever the maximum is, um, that's where the the partition will be stored. And again, just the the property of this algorithm is that it only allows. Um, um, a partition to be moved to a new node in event of a new node joining topology or just staying where it is without moving uh, whatsoever. So this is this is what minimal disruption is, right? So we either move it to the new node, which we want move partitions to, or we just don't do anything. All right, uh, one more question here. Have you ever considered consistent hashing as an alternative to random hashing? That's a great question. Uh, if I remember correctly, it guarantees better data data balancing and minimal data movement around. Um, yeah, so um, we actually used to have consistent hashing before random hashing. So we switched, we, we, we did the switch other way around. So we switched from uh, consistent hashing to random hashing. And, uh, there were a couple of reasons for that. So as I said, first of all, random hashing is much kind of simpler to understand, to implement, um, and therefore just less risk basically to use this algorithm. But also, at least in our particular circumstances, uh, it actually showed better distribution than consistent hashing. Um, but again, these are this easily can, I don't think there is a fundamental uh, statement that one of those algorithms is better in terms of data distribution because f first of all a lot depends on which particular hash function the underlying hash function you're using right because the again the the rendable hashing algorithm is uh, very straightforward but it also has to utilize some sort of a hashing function to calculate the efficient hash based on the partition and the node id consistent hash also relies on certain things there and um, again, based on our research, based on what we have tried, <laughs> random hashing uh, has shown better results. Uh, but again, this just this just might be us, and this just might be some specifics of our database. But yeah, as I said, we've used uh, 
cast system hashing before, like way before, like years before, but now we're using renderable hashing and we don't really see any, any particular pra practical issues with it. All right, I don't see any more questions and I think I'm running out of time. So thanks, uh, thank you guys, everyone for joining, for listening. And uh, I hope you uh, liked the talk. I hope the information was useful. Um, thank you, thank you so much and uh, have a great day or evening. Thank you. <laughs>